Okay, this is a tutorial on the merchant's tile. I'm going to summarize using some of the resources from Mr. Dor Dore. Um, um, and this section, we're looking at the merchant's tile from the, the night of the wedding nights and the introduction of Damien um, on page around 55 up to about page um, 80. One um, on the introduction of Proserpina and Pluto in the garden. Okay. Right then. Let's make a start. Um, in our last session, we talked about the wedding night and how um, comic it is. Um, we looked at um, Obviously, the comedy is in this idea of Fablo, this old man and this young woman. And whenever you look at Chaucer, you've got to think of irony, okay? And the ironic presentation of January and the ironic view of himself that January has. Now, that's kind of interesting. And that probably feeds into a lot of English comedy is the fool who thinks that they are wise. And um, this is something that goes back to Chaucer. We seem to like idiots who think that they're brilliant. And January thinks he's brilliant in bed. And the comedy is perhaps in January trying to rush everyone out of the wedding feast so that he can get down to business with his May. And so if we look at page 53, we begin with this idea of Damien being struck. Uh, Damien, obviously, his name is symbolic of demon and carrying on the fact the, the familiar analogy or the allusion to the Garden of Eden story. And he is lovesick for May. He is woeful. So immediately, an audience of the merchant's audience would recognize in Damien the courtly lover. So the lovesick Romeo, who's in love with, who has an unrequited love for someone who's usually and who he can't ever have. Uh, and Damien is seen as attractive, whereas he's the opposite of January. But he's hurt by Venus's bronze. He's hurt by love. And so this, this presentation of courtly love, which you should know what courtly love is, in many ways, you studied courtly love romance in the Tempest last year with Miranda, Caliban, and Ferdinand. Ferdinand takes on the role of the courtly lover, lovesick from Miranda, willing to undertake tasks for her love. Uh, and the obstacle to his love is, is Prospero, where in this case, the obstacle to Damien's love is January. Okay. But when I think about irony and you always go into an exam on Chaucer and you always be prepared to use the word irony and ironic presentation that even in the presentation of courtly love in this story Chaucer gives us an ironic comic version of courtly love it's not very serious and so he's playing up the courtly love romance of Damien ironically he's probably not hurt by love but he's probably lusting after her is more the more the idea. He retires early and May and January go to bed, lines five, nine, six. But down the bottom of the page, we have the first introduction on page 53 of um, God grant thee thine homely for to spy in this world is no worse pestilence than a friendly foe, a homely foe, all day in thy presence. So the bottom of page 53 is almost an allusion to sight and the idea of seeing is understanding. And O oh, Perilous Fire, down to the bottom of the page, is an example of apostrophe. The merchant is addressing this uh, character, Damien, on the, or this idea of jealousy. And, and he's saying to January, even though January can't hear him, Beware the friendly foe. Be wise to see where danger is. 
And so it's alluding to or foreshadowing the, the, the obvious um, uh, betrayal in the marriage early on. Okay, page 55, uh, January obviously is um, promises to make love to uh, her slowly. January thinks he's such a lover. Um, and that's where the comedy is. We know he's different to what she thinks she is. Um, one of the things that we should talk about is the description of animals that we see in, in this part of the text. And one of those things is always look out for and maybe make a record of the names that are used. Uh, so uh, Damien is like to the nada. Um, so Damien is described almost like an adder, like the snake. And again, this is foreshadowing or alluding to the Garden of Eden story and the devil and the temptation in the Garden of Eden. So Damien is the snake. Fresh May, she's described earlier like, you know, young lamb. And let's look at how January is described. We'll look at this um, on the next page, I think. Um, but January is described as a hound fish with his rough skin and as this contrast with fresh May. So I always tell students, just remember single quotes, fresh, Houndfish, the nadder, um, so that you kind of see this pattern all the time in the use of animals. Um, now, January has sex with May. He's very pleased with himself. Of course, um, she thinks he's playing not worth a bean, uh, which is probably the most dismissive uh, uh, review of lovemaking in literature. Um, but all the time, January is very pleased with himself and his performance. So there's a kind of irony of self. How there's the gap between how the individual sees themselves and how the reader or the audience see them. So there's an ironic gap that Chaucer stroke the merchant makes. Is that clear? And he sits up singing and almost cultish. The lovemaking makes him feel young again. He chats away like a pie, like a magpie. So like a bird that sings. So there's a kind of irony in the descriptions of the animals used to describe January. So just be aware of that, that May is left unimpressed. Okay, so we return to Damien Sorrows, the courtly lover, the ironic presentation of the courtly lover. He's woeful. He's languishing in love. The merchant calls Damien silly, silly uh, for loving a married woman and claims that May will reject him and betray him. Okay. In this case, I think silly means foolish or simple. But the courtly lover, we should always look out for words to describe Damien as a courtly lover. Sick, S-I-K-E, woeful, lovesick, full of pity. Um, Jantelis uh, is a word that's often used in Chaucer. It suggests the kind of the better kind of virtues of a knight, the Jantelis, um, virtues of honor, of nobility, of courage, of integrity. So whenever this word is used for Damien, it's being used ironically, just as when it's used for this worthy connect, that's used ironically as well. Okay. So Damien conforms to the courtly lover. He writes, uh, he falls ill with love. He writes a love letter. Uh, he takes to his bed. And so this is always kind of presented ironically. And again, burning with desire. He, he, he proclaims he's going to die. Off. He can endure it no longer. Uh, and he writes a letter for all his sore So just remember these kind of woeful, sore sorrow, die off. Um, it suggests this man is uh, in the courtly love condition, but he's not like Ferdinand, he's not full of honour, and we're not to see him that way, I suppose. Now, um, one of the things that is said about Damien by the merchant, and I think I, I have it here, I'm using someone else's notes here, 
January is worried for his gentle squire because he's ill. One of the things, one of the positive, one of the things that you could say that is decent about January is that he does care for his servant. He is kindly in that sense. And he respects Damien. And he describes Damien as wise, discreet, and secret. All the things a young squire stroke servant should be for their knight, for their master. But obviously, for the reader, there's an irony in these words. Okay, because in order to deceive January, Damien has to be wise, discreet, and secret. So again, there's a kind of absence, an ironic absence of knowledge that January has about himself. He's blissfully unaware of what's going to happen to him. So what the way the way that Chaucer constructs the, this this particular tale is is is, is full, full of irony and the idea that. We know what a fablo is. It's a story about an old man who is going to be comically deceived. Uh, and, and so we know what's going to happen. It's rather like us all going to the cinema and watching a horror film and knowing that something scary is going to happen. And we, we're expecting it. So Chaucer uh, uses irony to raise the level of expectation of knowing what's going to happen. And sometimes he closes or slows down the pace to delay the inevitable. Um, I'll take any questions if anyone has any at this particular moment. Otherwise, I'll continue. Again, the idea that um, Damien is manly and serviceable, it has kind of sexual connotations there. And so he sends May to look after him and to find out if he's okay. So um, we know what's going to happen then. She gets her love letter from Damien, and she hides it about her person. And down by his bedside, she sits, comforting as goodly as she may. So in the presentation of May, Chaucer describes her as almost motherly and virtuous. But to the audience, this is completely ironic because we know what she's going to do because of the expectation of what the story is. So we never take the merchant's descriptions of characters on face value, and it's worth making a note of that. Everything that's said is often said ironically. The Americans say that the British are obsessed with irony. and You never really understand what they actually truly intend to say. And that's probably due to irony being at the root of a lot of our comedy and a lot of our literature. So she hid this love letter in her purse. Again, it's the idea of the uh, unrequited love goes back to the, the courtly love romance of King Arthur and Guinevere and King Arthur's favourite knight, Lancelot, falling in love with his wife. And this is one of the greatest pieces of literature and it's a courtly romance. And Chaucer would have been well-versed in writing courtly romances, serious ones. But here he gives us a crude, um, ironic, a parody almost of a courtly love romance. She went her way. Um, so again, the idea of her being fresh uh, is ironic in itself in some ways. So she takes her letter home and she goes to the toilet. And it's kind of, um, even the narrator, the merchant, in the way that uh, this would be probably about line 740. So I've moved on to, we've leapt forward a bit to maybe page 65 by now. May takes this love letter back and she goes to the place and the merchant sometimes, even though he tells us a story about sex and um, the sexual night and everything, the merchant sometimes puts on an ironic persona of being coy, of shy, of not wanting to offend the reader. Um, so we've got irony at play in that Chaucer is writing as an ironic persona of a merchant, an unhappily married merchant. And then this merchant is writing ironically as a kind of discreet, not wanting to offend 
uh, narrator as well. So he says, um, he describes her going to the um, to the toilet, and he de he doesn't describe it as the toilet. But he says, "There, as you would, there, as you know, that everyone must need go seven three nine. And so he kind of, he, he doesn't wish to offend. And later on, he declares, I'm not going to tell you what happens because I don't wish to offend you. But again, this story is one of sex and betrayal and, you know, laughing at old people. So it's kind of, he's kind of ironically um, being sensitive and squeamish. So the language of... Um, she of uh, Damien is one of um, and of and the descriptions of May are ironically caught in courtly love language. Uh, I'm going to come back to that. So in describing May, um, he says, "Pity reigneth soon in gentle heart." So, so she was driven by pity for Damien more than anything else. But really the reader knows that she's probably as sexually desirous of getting with him as he is with her. But Chaucer couches it in a kind of ironic language, poetic language of, of um, courtly love. Right, then we move on. Um, where have we got to? May returns to January's bed on page 65. And that might be wrong. Where are we going? Give me a second. She goes back to bed on page 65. And they do in bed what uh, January wants to do, I have sex. But the narrator ironically says, whether it be paradise or hell, I dare not to you tell. So he leaves it to us to figure out what the reaction is of May again. And again, the reference to paradise or hell reminds us of the story of the Garden of Eden that is going to come. So we're constantly, constantly being reminded, remember what happened to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, this Garden of Eden story is also in the Decameron, other texts. The readers and the audience would know exactly what's going to happen. And they're constantly being reminded of that, ironically. Um, so January demands to see her again, and they have sex. But we don't know. I dare not to tell whether her thought it paradise or hell, line 752. So page 67, May decides to visit Damien again and she brings a letter of her own and she's got a plan. The language used to describe May's actions fuses love and violence in much the same way as January's initial response to her at the wedding. She has such an impression that day of pity for this sick Damien. She did not want to displease him. She wanted to love him best of any creature. So pity reigneth soon in gentle heart. So again, it's Chaucer on line 772, page 67, is giving her that sense of being a courtly lover, but at the same time, it's being done ironically. Right. May decides through pity and charity that she's gonna grant her very grace out of pity to Damien. And um, I don't know what line that was. Line 780, she says, granted him her, she would rather than have granted him her grace, uh, she would have him starve in his place well rather than and granted him her grace. So there's a kind of 
she decides to give her very grace on 785. So again, the language is quite romantic, quite courtly love. She's going to grant him her very grace, but really what she's going to grant him is, is her body. But again, it's out of pity. This is the merchant being ironic and perhaps being ironic about women. He, we know that he distrusts women. He thinks they are uh, not to be trusted. And so he's describing her with these virtuous qualities, ironically, because we know he doesn't believe them. You notice how many times I've said ironically this, this uh, session. Okay, there's hope for Damien and there's tragedy for January. Damien is recovered from an Ill his illness and May is going to sleep with him. January lives like a king but grows increasingly possessive. At this point in the story, um, one of the seven deadly sins, I suppose, is covetousness and jealousy, and it must be punished. And so January on, uh, is, um, who lives his life deliciously, according to his senses, he deliciously suggests a kind of sensuousness, um, must be punished. Remember what Justin has said, he who has heaven on earth is likely to be punished, um, might, is likely to find his purgatory as well. And so his jealousy leads him to create a walled garden. Um, and, you know, the symbolism of the Garden of Eden is, is, is there. And um, this is a garden of Epicurean pleasure. Epicurus is the god of pleasure and good living, and um, also the, the god of gardens. Um, and this is a place of sexual delight. And maybe if there is any moral, the moral that living solely for the pleasures of the, of the flesh is going to be is going to come back to punish people. Uh, and of course, the punishment is oh sudden fortune hap oh sudden hap fortune. This apostrophe um, on lines eight nine seven eight four five. Oh sudden happening, oh thou fortune unstable. He is struck blind. So Chaucer, you should know, uses apostrophe sometimes. Oh sudden happening. O Damien, where, where the, the merchant addresses a character who can't hear them. That's the use of apostrophe. And on 845, we see it here. The merchant is talking about um, how fate or fortune is like a scorpion, so deceiving, so deceivable. And again, deception is something that comes into this. Now, January is struck blind. Blindness is a symbol, perhaps, of maybe... Uh, you know, maybe having too much sex, perhaps people seem to assume that it might lead to blindness. So maybe there's sexual punishment uh, being uh, suggested in his affliction. But also blindness is in literature all the time, isn't it? Blindness is a kind of um, is a, a metaphor, a symbolism for understanding. So January was blind when he could see, and now he's fully blind. It's just symbolic of that. We see that in, in, in Gloucester, in King Lear as well with Shakespeare. Gloucester has his eyes gouged out and then says, I was blind when I could see, and now that I have no eyes, I can, I can see perfectly. I understand. You see, you see, you understand. Symbolism of seeing is always there. Okay. Um... Right, what was going to say here? So we've got the Garden of Illusion. There's a reference to Pyramus and Thisbe, you might rem remember from Midsummer Night's Dream. Again, that's another courtly love story in which Pyramus and Thisbe are blocked from seeing each other by a wall. And remember the mechanicals in the Midsummer Night's Dream put on this story about um, two lovers uh, um, blocked by a wall uh, in a walled garden. One's in it and one's out of it. So it's always a well-known story. The garden, the Garden of Eden, the wicket and the clicket, the key and the lock are symbolic, graphic, 
um, sexual symbolism there that you should be aware of. And the key uh, that May makes for Damien is made of wax. She shapes it from warm wax. Now remember how January says, I must have a young woman because I can shape her like wax. So comedy often relies on something that you seed in earlier that you then reveal at the end. A little bit like stand-up comics sometimes use their last line is funny because they kind of planted the seeds of that line earlier on. But I swear I'm talking to myself here. It's a bit of a tutorial to say, you know, I'm not the mad joke. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, where was I? There's a line about deception on line 897 that's kind of worth quoting because every year the examiners give you an essay on deception. Uh, one of the themes of literature is the difference between appearance and reality. And you'll be doing the Duchess of Malfi and the characters who appear to be good who aren't, some characters who, aren't, who appear to be bad turn out to be good. It's a typical question that the examiners set. And the quote is, for as good is blind, deceived be, as to be deceived when a man may see. So um, if you are easily gullible and taken in, you're already blind, whether you've lost your sight or not. And so I think that's kind of worth um, just bearing in mind. So the poem's narrative progresses into summer and May season, and January's power wanes. Um, you find in Chaucer quite a lot of references to astrology. Um, the time has gone by. Uh, Chaucer is quite the expert on astrology, and people believed in star signs affecting their behaviour in some ways. Uh, not that Chaucer always believed in that, but certainly he was kind of um, aware of this. And it shows itself in quite a number of tales. And um, there was a reference to something. I'm trying to think Give me a second. Yeah, he says that there's kind of references to Taurus and Cancer and the idea of Venus coming into Mars and the time of the season is kind of reminding us that these star signs, Taurus and Cancer, not that I know much about them, and the, the planets, Mars and Venus, kind of crossing paths suggests the oncoming warring factions, divisions of two opposite sides coming together. You need to not know more than that, really. I always say to students, don't struggle with knowing every single line, okay? If there's a couple of lines that you struggle with, don't worry about it. If you can get the gist of paragraphs and what's going on in them, uh, and you can see something in terms of how the language is being shaped and how the uh, Chaucer uses certain techniques and what the main themes are again and again, that's going to be the most important thing. Don't struggle with understanding every single line because I don't, and, you know, a lot of scholars are in conflict about it. So, May and Damien's relationship splits uh, into, um, they are complicit with each other, and they develop through sign language what they're going to eventually do, so that we know how this is going to turn out. Um, so they both agree that they are uh, in love with each other or in lust with each other is probably more likely. Damien on page 73, line 885, says that he is the most sorrowfullest, sorrowfullest man, sorrowfullest man there is. So she makes a wax key for him to have. The lovers are compared to the lovers of Pyramus and Thisbe, a forbidden fruit couple from Ovid's Metamorphosis, but also from A Midsummer Night's Dream. But again, stories that take place in gardens, and courtly love romances take place in gardens, 
But this isn't a courtly love romance. They are going to get together and have sex. So we've got many co common aphorisms associated with love is blind, they say. Again, reminding us of what's going on. Now, Damien steals into the garden and sits under a bush. And all the while, sorry, just on the wrong page. Any questions? Actually, if anyone wants to ask me a question with the microphone, it'd be interesting to see if I can hear you. Does anyone want to ask me a question? Because I know I've gone through this quite quickly. Fair enough. Does anyone want to type a question? I'm just trying to buy time, see, so I can say what I want to say. Okay. I'm going to turn to page um, If you, um, I haven't talked about the description of the garden. There's a long descriptive bit with heightened poetic elements to it. And again, it's probably one of the most poetic parts in, in the whole tale. Again, that's parody in the descriptions of walled gardens in all of um, literature. But again, it's done ironically because this isn't a romance story. This is a story of deception. So, um, I'm going to talk about what January asks on page 79. So January's full of, um, he's full of um, jealousy and lust, but he gets his, his wife in the garden and he tells her, I am wounded in my heart. He says, he calls her my dove sweet. She has breasts sweeter than wine. He uses the language and poetry of a courtly lover himself. So January uses this kind of, um, well, on page 77, he uses the language of courtly love. How fair have been thy breasts and wine. My love, rise up, my love, my lady free, my dove sweet. Again, um, he's now being cast in the role of courtly lover. But again, even January's role is ironic. He isn't the courtly lover. And January isn't, and Damien isn't the courtly lover either. So on page 79, um, January, be it for love or lust or jealousy, says, now wife, here is but thou and I, and not, lines 950, thou art the creature that I best love. For by that love that sit in heaven above, Never eke had to die on a knife than thee offend. I'd rather die on a knife than offend thee. For God's sake, think how I thee chose, not for covetous, doubtless, but only for the love I had of thee. Well, on line 955, maybe we can disagree with the reason January truly went into uh, marriage. And you've probably discussed that in your classes. Was it for love? Was it for lust? January said he married because it was so easy and so clean, spiritually clean and easy because he had sex on tap, I suppose. But here he says, I did it out of pure love. And maybe we can take an ironic view of that. But then he goes on to tell, uh, to tell me the truth. I will tell you why. There are three things, certs, you shall win by. Uh, uh, but only um, he asks her to be true. And he goes, if you're true to me, there are three things that you will win. And I'm going to stop in eight minutes. What are those three things she will gain if she stays true to January? He says, on lines 955, I don't know whether this is where he, he actually gains a kind of sense of self-knowledge. 
I did it only for the love I had of thee, he says, I married you. Debatable. And though that I be old and may not see, be if to me true, and I will tell you why. So maybe there's just a little part of January at this point who realises I'm too old here. I'm too old for you. But he says, be true. And the three things he says, if you stay true to me, this is the deal. This is what you get. You get A, a love of Christ. You get B, um, you win honour to yourself and honour in the town, in your family, in, 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 all around. And three, you win my estate. You get all of my estate. But the deal is, you stay true to me in this life and also when I die. So you can't marry someone else. And maybe there's a, a degree of, I don't know, depends. Some people have sympathy for January and some don't. Some never have sympathy for January. But maybe at this stage, there's, is it jealousy or old age playing on him? We're never quite sure. But May weeps. She promises January that she would never be unfaithful. And she says some interesting things. Her, her defiance is, is worth maybe taking some notes on as I finish on this session now. Because uh, I think her defiance reminds me of strong female characters in other texts that you might be comparing. And I'm thinking of the Duchess of Malfi. And she says, I have, where is this? Her answer. She says, um, I have a soul to keep, for to keep. So she says, I have um, a soul for to keep. Um, on page 81, line 977. I have a soul for to keep. She makes a defiant defense of her virtue and um, of my wifehood, thick, tender flower. She's got, she, so she says, I've got a soul to defend. I've got my reputation as a wife to descend, which I assured you of when I gave you my body bond. She says on lines 984, I pray to God that never a day, never dawns the day that I starve, starve, as foul as woman may, if ever I do unto my kin, that shame. So she swears that never the day should come that she should um, bring shame upon her kin, be that family or be that women as a, as a race. Or else uh, I impair so my name. Or she wishes the day would never come that she might lose her name, her reputation if I should be false. And she says, strip me and put me in a sack and in the next river, drown me, drench me. So she, she says, treat me like, I don't know, a cat, a kitten that you might drown in the river. And she stands defiant. She says, I am a gentle woman, line 990, and no rent and no wench. So it's quite a powerful, strong speech of defiance about a woman saying, I have a soul, I have a reputation to my name, to my family, to womanhood, and drown me like, a, like an, uh, a cat if I should betray. So it's a really strong speech. Um, and she says, why do I speak like this? Because men never trust us. They always speak us untrue. Um, and they speak to us of untrust and reprieve. This is where I'm going to end on line 994. She makes quite a sound, strong speech, but of course, it's completely undercut. This is the merchant, after all, who's telling us a story, and he doesn't trust women, but he gives us a woman giving a powerful speech. But the next line, and with that word, line 995, she saw where Damien sat in the bush, and she coughed, she began, and with her finger, signs made she that Damien should climb upon a tree. The rhyme, the right, uh, this story, uh, this is a verse narrative told in rhyming couplets, iambic pentameter rhyming couplets, or rhyme royale. 
The rhyming couplets add to the comic effect of the merchant's ironic portrayal. So it ends in this defiant woman giving a defiant speech, but it's undercut by her telling her to get her man up in the tree. Okay. Um, so appearance versus reality is a theme well used in this story. The fruit tree, uh, the garden is a place of temptation. Eve is tempted just as she is tempted. So we have an ironic situation. This, um, this garden has an ironic meaning attached to it. Um, the following page, we have a digression. Just as Damien climbs up the tree, the, the um, Chaucer decides to slow the pace down. And he starts to give us a very poetic, elevated poet, poetic description. I'm going to finish here. On, on bright was the day and blew the firmament. Phoebus, the god of the sun, half of gold his streams down sent to gladden every flower with his warmness. And Chaucer bangs on for a bit, describing in great elevated poetry how sunny the day was. Again, that's ironic. Chaucer isn't really interested in, in giving us a poetic account. He's delaying what we want to know. We want to know what's going to happen when, Jan when Eve jumps up in the tree. We want to know what happens. So like a good writer, he slows that down. So the use of pace by Chaucer is something to consider. Okay, that I think brings us to um, the end of our tutorial. Um, now, um, I hope that's kind of given you uh, something to think about. Are there any questions from anyone um, about anything maybe I rushed over that you want to consider? Um, does anyone want to? Okay. Um, right. So if I call that to the end of the meeting, and um, I will make this video available if any of you should need it. Okay. Thanks a lot for attending. I hope you found that useful. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.